being in a, in a place where there's a high concentration of air pollution might actually be creating this inflammatory insult to the brain. So it was like, wow, the gut is connected to the brain. <laughs> totally, totally connected to the brain. So literally, there are yep. viruses, yeast, bacteria in the brain that may be triggering this cascade of inflammation. And then the question is, where does this come from? Certain foods may uh, trigger brain fog. Um, and it is something that I think is intimately connected to the gut. I think mm. the, uh, uh, and we'll talk about that at this particular case, is gut fermentation uh, is oftentimes a cause for brain fog. I mean, it's like bugs fermenting the food you're eating, creating all these nasty Absolutely. byproducts. That yeah, and I, 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 mean, I, don't know, I don't know, Mark, if you've had patients who've had, this is a really interesting thing, because I have patients come in and they say, I feel like my gut is just like bloating and I'm fermenting, and that's exactly what's happening. So yeah. there is there is a condition. I just recently had a patient who had auto brewery syndrome. Yeah, and I, I've seen so you have that. your own like beer factory. Exactly, so when, when you want to make beer, <laughs> what, what do you do? You take sugar and you add yeast to it, and you can actually produce alcohol. Mm -hmm. And I've had a couple of cases uh, where it was missed and it's actually not just the recent findings is it's not just yeast in the gut that uh, do this but also klebsiella bacteria mm. so ba both bacteria and yeast can actually produce these compounds which are toxins alcohol is a toxin that's why mm. when you get drunk you're intoxicated mm -hmm. and uh you you'll actually produce alcohol and other toxins which affect your brain it's, it's interesting it, I, ne I never really had that insight before you said that word intoxicated you're Toxic. You're toxic. You're toxic. Exactly. That's what it was. Intoxicated. I was like, wow, yeah, that's okay. A, that's, how, that's how I explained it to the patients. It took me 60 years to figure that yeah, out. Figure that one out. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. But I think that, that you're, what you're saying is very true. I mean, I've had two times in my life when I've had severe brain fog. One was when I had mercury poisoning 30, 25 years ago. And my gut was a mess then because the mercury poisoned my gut. I had terrible bloating, distension, diarrhea. And uh, the second time was more recently when I had mold toxicity and I had C. diff and I also had colitis and gastritis and my whole gut was a mess and I had severe brain fog yeah. and it was pretty debilitating. You could barely focus, answer an email, talk to somebody. Oh yeah, you can't concentrate. You can't concentrate at all. Uh, and people think, oh, that's just sort of in your head. It's not in your head, maybe in your stomach. <laughs> Well, it's manifesting in the head. That's the whole yeah. thing. Is is it's and it, and we you know we have these artificial boundaries between the, the the brain and the body and the mind and they're all interconnected and mm -hmm. and and brain fog is a real uh, it's a real phenomenon and then you have to sort of figure out well, what is what's doing it. Mm -hmm. The other thing that's uh, is is uh, interesting that I see with some people with brain fog is uh, just gluten and dairy. Yeah, and I, I tell patients that you know the most one of the most addictive foods is pizza, and the reason for that is that pizza has gluten in it. It's true. Yeah. You can eat a whole pie, right? Exactly. Oh yeah, I, love, I, I, I tell you, I, it's one of it's one of the foods that I, I'll occasionally indulge in, but uh, it's I don't have it that often because yeah. it's not not the best food for you. But well, you, get, you have my cauliflower pizza with yeah. goat cheese. Yeah, right. my you, cauliflower can, you, can, you can make a healthy pizza. Exactly. Yeah. But but I, the, the two foods which are interesting is that gluten and dairy both get broken down. The proteins in those uh, get broken down into caseomorphins and gluteomorphins. And caseomorphins are the ones from dairy, and gluteomorphins are from gluten, and those have morphine-like effects. So you literally you become get you know, a little high. You get a little, yeah, you get a little high. You get a little foggy in the brain, uh, and it also can cause cravings, and and um, it can sort of make you sleepy. You know, you eat it, and then you get a little 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 sleepy uh, from it also. Uh, and that's you know when 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 children uh, drink breast milk they go to sleep after they they you know they they conk out I mean that's because of the morphine like action uh, in milk yeah so that's true I think you know it's, it can be our diet it can be uh, food sensitivities like gluten and dairy which are really common and often people going on an elimination diet will have an immediate relief of brain fog which mm -hmm. is something that you don't know you have until you don't have it anymore sometimes people just think of this sort of slow decline of their cognitive function, they're not realizing that it's actually uh, something that can be reversed and mm -hmm. it can be reversed very quickly. So yeah. uh, the second thing is, you know, the the factors that, that are in the gut, right? Bacterial overgrowth, yeast overgrowth, we call it dysbiosis. That yep. can also lead to a lot of cognitive issues because your gut's connected to your brain and that causes this, this effect when the bugs are out of balance and it drives inflammation and then you get inflammation in the brain essentially is what causes brain fog. Absolutely. Well, and the other, the other important thing, and I think I talked about uh, this last time, is that the blood flow from the gut has to go through the liver. 
Mm. And the reason for that is, is to filter all of the toxins that are there. So there's a, there's a lot of immune cells, the copper cells in the liver, and a lot of filtering processes and detoxification takes place in the liver prior to the blood from the gut uh, then going into the systemic circulation. So sometimes you'll have, in addition to uh, 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 leaky gut, you'll have problems with detoxification in the liver itself. Mm -hmm. And that's, you know, an example of that is uh, the condition uh, uh, hepatic encephalopathy, which is yeah. brain fog. That's, that's essentially, Well, you talk know, about that. What is that for people who don't know what that sounds so, like a so big word? I, I learned, I learned, and I think I, I mentioned this before, and it was one of the things that really stuck with me is uh, when I worked at the VA hospital, there was a lot of uh, alcoholics. And when you're an alcoholic, you basically turn your liver into, into a, a pickled, pickled liver. You trash your liver, yeah. You trash your liver, and then you're not able to detoxify. And uh, I would typically see this over and over where patients had cirrhosis of the liver and their liver was not able to detoxify. And then when they, they, they would eat foods, especially high protein uh, type meals, they would get hepatic encephalopathy and literally go into a coma. So and they would literally get delirium, confusion, absolutely. brain that's, fog. Brain fog. That's, that's, when, that's when like they're, the brain when they're fog on steroids. And the reason is it was coming from their gut. And what I found so striking when I started learning about functional medicine was that here was a condition in medicine that we knew how to treat by fixing the gut we gave people antibiotics yeah to sterilize their gut to kill the bacteria that caused all these byproducts that made people have you know basically delirium or encephalopathy and yep. brain fog yeah so it was like wow the gut is connected to the brain <laughs> totally totally connected to the brain absolutely and and you and in some cases you know there have been cases of of uh, pe people actually having uh, psychosis from uh, 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 gut dysfunction. Yeah, you mentioned auto brewery syndrome. I, m I remember reading a case of a woman who um, was arrested for driving yeah. under the influence, and it turned out she wasn't drinking, but she had a high blood alcohol level that was coming from her gut. Yeah, yeah, it is. <laughs> yeah, and it's it's a very real phenomenon. You have to think about it, and uh, the, the way that you actually test for that is you you can. It's actually quite simple. Is you just have somebody do what I call a pancake challenge. You basically mm. some pancakes full of carbs, but throw some maple syrup on it, eat it, and get a blood draw at. Point zero, you, ha, you know, eat the eat the meal, and then half an hour hour later, check your alcohol level. That sounds that sounds like a fun medical test. The pancake a, yeah, challenge. I call, the pan, I call the pancake challenge. That's, so, yeah. so so we talked about the gut. We talked about gluten, dairy, food sensitivities. Uh, there are other reasons too. Uh, so infections. Infections can can uh, do that. Uh, another one that is tick I, infections. T oh, oh, absolutely. Yeah, tick infections. Lyme. Are, yeah. Oh, that th those are. Yeah, those. I would say that that, <clears throat> that that's in addition to brain fog, you get a lot of cognitive uh, dysfunction too. Yeah, memory more, issues. It's more severe. It's more, yeah, much more severe. The the one thing that I see a lot is allergies. I call it the allergic brain. Mm. Uh, and you can have food allergies um, that can potentially do that, or even environmental allergies or mold, um, and the high levels of histamine, because histamine is actually acts as a neurotransmitter. And I've seen this in a number of patients. Um, I've had some patients with um, another condition, which we're seeing more and more of, is mast cell activation syndrome. It's sort of a, a buzz, you know, buzz mm -hmm. uh, diagnosis now, but it's a very real phenomenon. And that is related to the mast cells, which are the types of immune cells in the body, in the interstitial, the sort of the spaces between the cells uh, where they reside. And they release lots of histamine. And if any of has ever had hay fever, you see that the typical picture of a person with hay fever, they're like you know, like this, like half asleep, and like they're walking through a fog. It's right. the hay fever is an example of a, of a, a brain fog. Yeah. Uh, and uh, antihistamines can actually have a benefit with that. Um, naturally, uh, things like quercetin and nettles can uh, can also be very helpful. Mm. And you probably have used it. This is something that I use. Um, I've been using more is the, the drug chromalin sodium. Yeah, which is I've had some amazing uh, success with that in more difficult <clears throat> cases. I wouldn't necessarily go to the, uh, that for my first uh, choice. So what, what Todd's talking about is is this, is this drug that's used for asthma and, and allergies that <clears throat> is usually inhaled. Yeah, usually inhaled. But there's a version you can take orally that before you eat, inhibits your white blood cells from releasing histamine yep. and creating an allergic response. And I've often found it extremely effective exactly. for some patients. Yeah. So Todd, uh, talk about this patient that you had that had really bad brain fog. This is a, a guy who'd come to see you who worked a lot, it was a little less stress, and that could be you know easily dismissed as, oh, you're just stressed and tired, but yeah. you, you went deeper. What did you find? 
Well, he actually came into me and he had already seen a variety of different doctors. Um, and the, the, this, the background is, is that the, the gentleman as a child had lots of allergies and asthma. So he had, you know, ear infections, bronchitis, uh, also developed some uh, sinusitis type symptoms. Mm -hmm. So he had multiple rounds of antibiotics. And uh, I always emphasize to patients that when you have an immune dysfunction, look for the gut because 60 to 70 percent of your immune system is mm -hmm. in the gut. And just like, you know, with what's going on with the COVID uh, virus and the, or the COVID-19 uh, 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 syndrome that we're seeing by coronavirus is it's not the virus or the bacteria itself that causes the problem. It's our immune system's response to it. Yeah. And um, in general, we want to have a, I call it a balanced uh, immune system. So we want our immune system to be idling. Yeah. So basically just sort of sitting there and, okay, we're enjoying planet Earth. We're going out for a walk. We're not reacting to the... Not underreacting or overreacting. Exactly. Un <clears throat> underreacting or overreacting. And when you overreact, that we call that an autoimmune disease. When you underreact, we call that AIDS. Uh, you right. Know, you know, so AIDS or cancer. AIDS or cancer. Or yeah. overreaction is allergies or right. autoimmune. Right. And, and, I, and I think, you know, we talk about like, you know, a weak immune system or a strong immune system. It's really, I think, an intelligent and a balanced immune system. That's how I like to think about yeah. it. Um, and that's, you know, related to uh, immunotolerance, which is what the gut uh, does. So when we have a healthy gut, we have an immune system that is tolerant to lots of things. And you can eat certain things. Mm. You can go out in the environment. You're not going to react to dog dander and, and all these other things. There are some genetic, uh, some people have genetic predispositions towards being more atopic or allergic. Mm. But having a healthy uh gut especially early on the priming of the gut is so critical mm. you know uh, having a vaginal birth being um, uh, breastfed uh, not introducing uh, certain foods like gluten early on in the in, in living life. on a farm <laughs> living on a farm exactly being exposed, being exposed to a lot of and, and crawling around in the dirt and literally putting dirt and you know i call it you know your your body's immune system samples planet earth planet earth is a very con dirty place. There's lots of bugs and all kinds of things. And your body learns to be immunotolerant. Mm -hmm. And, and, and uh, one of the things that is really I I'd also focus on is uh, part of this immune system is called the T-reg cells. The, the T-reg cells are like the conductor in the Boston Symphony Orchestra. So mm. you've got you know, the wind section over here and the horns over here, and they keep everything in balance. Yeah. And the T-regs are really, really critical. And what we're finding, so regulatory cells. they regulate, they regulate the whole, you know, the whole balance of the immune system and the T regs that we find out, um, the two things that are really simple that people can use to upregulate your T regs to keep things in balance are fibers, fibers in the diet. Fibers are the key things that help uh, with regulation of that. And then also, uh, which I use quite a bit in my, in the, in the patients that I see is vitamin A. Hmm. Vitamin A helps to downregulate. Uh, the immune system and helps to keep the uh, T reg cells uh, uh, in in uh, in place. So this this guy came in with brain fog and he had a lot of stress, but he also had other things. He had mold exposure. He yeah, said. he had he had he was working in a in a in a building and uh, they found out that he it was in a, in a water damaged building unknown to him and he had uh, mold exposure, which you, you've been uh, experienced yourself. Been lucky and, enough to have. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah, and 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 you know, and we live in in you know. A lot of people are in older buildings. Um, they, you know, and, and you don't know. You might buy the building, and there's water damage. You don't even know what's there. I mean, fifty percent of buildings have water damage in America. That's a lot. Really? Yeah. yeah. Wow. Wow. It, it, that's, that's a lot. Yeah. So he was actually he came to me, and he was he had the diagnosis of uh, mold toxic. In fact, he actually learned about this through the, one of your podcasts. I think it was you were uh, talking with David Asprey. <laughs> oh yeah, I was trying. <laughs> exactly. It was a moldy moldy uh, yeah. uh, podcast. So that's how he sort of went down that that road. And he got treated, uh, you know, with a variety of different therapies. He got some uh, IV glutathione. He got some ozone uh, therapies and other um, uh, uh, interventions. And he got about 50% better. And then within several months, he sort of went back to where he was. He was also, again, not um, sleeping much because he was, uh, you know, uh, he was uh, uh, doing a lot of uh, litigation. It was a lot of stress. He wasn't sleeping well. The big thing that I see with patients with um, uh, conditions like uh, immune dysregulation is stress. And lack of sleep is a stressor, probably the number one stressor. So if people aren't, aren't getting a deep restorative sleep, yeah. that is a stress to the immune system. Huge. And I was trying to sort of emphasize that you can't, you know, you can do that for like one or two days, but you can't do that on an ongoing basis. Uh, so really, really important. I will always emphasize getting good, deep restorative sleep uh, with patients. 
Um, so I emphasized uh, that with him. So when he came in, um, he also had a lot of uh, digestive symptoms. Um, he was actually on uh, a whole bunch of inhalers. He was on like uh, 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 Brio, uh, Spireva, Ventolin, on Zolair injections, Flonase uh, uh, for his uh, uh, sinuses. He also had uh, a Zolair lot of... is a very expensive, like $20,000 a year, oh. tense immune suppressing medication. Yeah. And he and, still and, wasn't better. It still wasn't better. No, exactly. And, and, that, and that, that actually worked by stabilizing mast cells, which um, you can actually naturally do. Uh, quercetin actually can help. Uh, High-dose quercetin can be very helpful for a mast cell it's stabilization. It's also good for COVID. Exactly. exactly. Yeah, yeah. Um, so, uh, so when he came in here, um, you know, I did a, a thorough workup on him, and I did retest him for mold. And he did have some mold, but it, I, I compared it to his previous labs, and it wasn't that bad. So I empirically treated him with some binders to sort of help. But he had already moved out of the, the quote, the mold, moldy building that he so was in. You get in out before. of the moldy environment and then use these binders to help get the mold toxins out of your system. That right, because the, the mycotoxins, they, they do tend to uh, uh, recirculate in the body, the enteropathic recirculation, so they'll get reabsorbed uh, by the body. And what are so the kind of binders you use? Um, in him, I actually used very natural things. Uh, I used uh, uh, clay, mediclay, and I also used activate charcoal. That was pretty yeah. much it. And so these are these are things that don't get absorbed that suck and suck all the bad stuff out. Oh yeah, exactly. And well, when we, you worked in emergency room, yeah. right? We used to if somebody would overdose on drugs. We'd give them charcoal. Yeah, that's, that's right. You make them drink black charcoal. It was terrible. Right. And, and every now and then they might vomit up on you. And get you know, black. <laughs> we, we've been there, done that. Yes. We, <laughs> right. Yeah. Right. So so this guy. Uh, had had also other stuff, right? He had gluten issues. Oh, gut, yeah, and a lot of gut yeah, issues. Yeah, yeah, and so, he, so, so he, and, and unfortunately, when he went to the the previous doctors who did help him out, they didn't go deep enough. They didn't sort of you know get mm. all the pieces of the puzzle. Mm. So uh, they they did not uh, check him for gluten sensitivity, which he would markedly was gluten sensitive, and also uh, did the Cyrex uh, testing on him for uh, gluten and Cyrex for leaky gut, and both of those were markedly positive. So those are tests that we use at the Ultra Wellness Center that are a little bit different than traditional food testing that looks at antibodies that aren't true allergy but there are reactions that our immune system is having against foods and we can tell what you should and shouldn't eat based on this what's causing an immune response exactly exactly and then also did uh did stool testing on them i uh did the uh what i think is sort of the state of the art the uh, the gi map test which uh does quantitative uh pcr for the dna of bacteria yeast viruses parasites and he had probably one of the worst cases of dysbiosis I've ever seen. That's yeah. imbalance. Yeah, imbalance. Yeah, a lot of lot, lot of uh, imbalances. You know, my I tell patients that everybody has you know hundreds of different kinds of bugs in their gut, and uh, they're a little bit like weeds in a garden. No garden does not have weeds. You just don't want too many weeds. And the interesting thing about uh, the the digestive tract and bacteria is that there is a phenomenon which is known as quorum sensing. And quorum sensing means that when certain bacteria reach a critical level, they start acting as, as bad actors. An example of that is like uh, Clostridium difficile. So when patients get antibiotics and they wipe out the good guys, the bacteria, the C. difficile, somehow or another sense that there's not enough cops around and they take over the place and they start producing toxins. Yeah. Same thing happens in this, in this particular case. He had one of the highest levels of Pseudomonas uh, right. bacteria that I've ever seen. And we typically see that uh, in patients with cystic fibrosis. Um, so he had uh, bacterial dysbiosis, that, that organism plus other organisms. And he had also. a lot of gut symptoms, right? He had uh, sticky, yeah. Yes, yeah, sti yeah, exactly. And... Yep, exactly. Very, yeah, mu a lot of uh, mucus. And that's, that, in my opinion, that, that mucus, that sticky uh, mucus is a biofilm. That's, that's where the bacteria live. They live in that, that biofilm layer. And antibiotics and such are very difficult to, to penetrate that. So you're not having a smooth log that just comes out clean. There may be some problems in there. Exactly. Right? <laughs> yeah. And uh, he also had yeast overgrowth, which was, you know, not unexpected. Because of all the antibiotics he had. Oh, yeah. Absolutely. Absolutely. And the acid blocker he was taking. He was on a proton pump inhibitor. <clears throat> oh, that's one of my, you know, I, I hate I hate them. I, they, I are, they are good and bad. They, they, I, they can take, be helpful. But I, mean, I remember when I was in medical school, we talked about this on the podcast, we were told... They just came out and they were like, these are very powerful drugs. You don't want to give them to any patient more than six weeks. It shuts down acid production. It's risky long-term. 
And now everybody's on it for They're life. over the counter. They're over the counter. Over the counter and for life. And it causes all sorts of disruption in the gut. It causes you it, to not absorb your nutrients. It causes overgrowth of yeast. It changes the pH. It leaky gut. Leaky gut. I mean, it causes irritable bowel. So you osteoporosis. Know, yeah, osteoporosis, pneumonia. B12 so you, deficiency. Yeah, there we go. We can keep going. It's, not, not, <laughs> it's, a, great, it's a great way to keep the business going, isn't cow. it? Yeah, I wrote a textbook chapter on reflux. And it was like, we're looking at all the data. It was like, holy cow, this is not good. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. And and uh, unfortunately, they're handed out like Pez candy. Yeah. And and patients stay on them long term. Come on, term. what's wrong with Pez candy? I used to eat that all the time. I had my little Pez dispenser. For yeah. those of you who are uh, younger, you might not know what this is, but it's a little candy dispensing <laughs> device with a little cute cartoon character on the top. And you'd, Donald Duck. You'd or... pull it open, and then a little candy would pop out, and it was so fun to eat. <laughs> <laughs> it was? Yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> I, was, I, I quit when I was like eight. No. <laughs> so, so this guy had all this stuff, and he, he had gut issues, he had gluten issues, he had mold issues. And what, what, what I find really important to, to emphasize is that in functional medicine, it's, it's about looking at the whole system and not just treating one thing. Yeah. And often it's many things at the same time. Yeah. Because when the system breaks down, lots of things break down. Yeah. So you say, oh, moving... this guy's gluten issues. Well, getting off the gluten wouldn't have fixed him. Or just fixing the mold wouldn't have fixed him. Or just fixing his gut wouldn't have fixed him. You've got to deal with all these various things. And you had, you know, another thing that you found on him as well, right? Oh, yeah. yeah sinus issues. Sinus issues. That was, a, that was actually, he actually had sinus surgery. Uh, for that, and uh, it was it was a, a really a big thing, and in fact, I actually just recently uh, downloaded a paper from uh, uh, PubMed on the nasal microbiome. Yeah. Uh, so you know we have bacteria on our skin, we have it in our mouth, we have it in our digestive tract, in the vagina, in the sinuses. They're, they're all everywhere. they're everywhere. <clears throat> they're everywhere, and um, so disruption of the nasal microbiome uh, can also cause brain fog. Uh, typically, you see that a lot. And all the steroids um, he was taking up his nose and everything ab- was affecting absolutely. him. Absolutely. And it's also, it's a, it's a dark, moist environment. So a lot of patients who have chronic sinusitis, it's actually been shown not so much to be bacterial as it is to be uh, yeast, uh, fungal. Uh, fungal, fungal origin. Yeah. So you got to really think about that. Um, I typically will, you know, uh, start, in, in his case, he had, he actually had, he, he needed surgery. So he actually had sinus surgery mm. that helped a little bit, but it didn't clear up the problem, yeah. which is really yeah. uh, a, 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 a dysfunctional uh, nasal microbiome. So I actually treated him with um, uh, neti pot nasal saline uh, irrigation. Uh, you can also do, uh, there are uh, certain machines. Uh, yeah, I like the Sinopulse machine. Sinop- it's like a water pick for your nose. Exactly. And, it, water and pick. you put a saline in there and it rinses it out. Rinses it out, right. And for people who do have chronic sinus issues. And then I also, in his case, I actually used um, uh, silver silin, which is a uh, not a colloidal silver, but it's a silver sol. And uh, silver is actually a great antimicrobial, and I used that in him with great success. It was really very, very effective. So silver is also something that kills bugs. Kills bugs. And you put it up your nose, and it'll help deal with whatever latent infections are there. Exactly. And and in this particular paper that I was talking about, uh, which is discussing the nasal microbiome, they were actually uh, making a, pro- a proponent to actually use probiotics, like things like lactobacillus, up into the nasal passages yeah. to recolonate the, the nose. Incredible. Yeah. So do and, like and, a fecal translate up your nose. Exactly. <laughs> and, 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 and Dale Bredesen, uh, who's been a leader in looking at the various causes for Alzheimer's, talks about the uh, the nasal sinus passages as a, uh, a problem when you have chronic inflammation in the sinuses being mm. a risk factor for Alzheimer's. Because mm. yeah. that, that, that is directly... Chronic inflammation, right. The chronic inflammation, exactly. And it goes right up into the brain. So, so you also did this nasal treatment. You also treated his gut. So what did you do for his gut? Um, I tra- I mean, what I, we did obviously we put him on a uh, an elimination uh, diet. So you got also, him off the gluten. A, a, got him off of gluten. Starchy exactly. Starchy foods. That yeah. Ferment, and right? got got him off a, a sort of a, a low yeast, low mold uh, type diet. Um, got him on. Put him on a. I actually did not treat him with uh, antibiotics. I treated him with uh, antimicrobial botanicals. I also used uh, oral silver, uh, which uh, I'll sometimes use in conjunction, and uh, and I also continued with binders. Um, the uh, Activated charcoal and then another product, uh, GI uh, detox, and it was pretty rem- rem- uh, remarkable his success. Within a month, he said, "Is he like like the light bulb went on in his brain?" Yeah. Well, so you mentioned a product called GI detox, which is something we use that actually has charcoal and clay in it, right? Clay, so yeah. it actually helps to bind up all the nasty things that get produced by these bad bugs yep. when they're fermenting the foods that you shouldn't be eating, Yep. right? So yep. it's, it's really, a, it's fascinating. So you, you also 
sort of looked at this holistically from a functional medicine perspective, which is really quite different yeah. than most people. So the fact that this patient had gluten and mold and imbalanced gut flora and sinus issues was the reason for his brain fog, mm -hmm. right? But if you take 10 people with brain fog, they might have 10 different reasons. Absolutely, just like you have 10 different reasons for cough. Right, mine was mercury, you know, that, that didn't show up in this guy. So <clears> it, <throat> really it's very, it's right, it's important. I think this is the thing that's so different about functional medicine is that we don't just stop thinking at the symptoms. We go, well, what's the cause of the symptoms? Absolutely. If you say, you know, you have rheumatoid arthritis or you have a headache or migraine, Migraine isn't a diagnosis, it's a symptom. It's a certain type of headache, Absolutely, right? It's yeah. like, <laughs> and, and, and so we, we really have to look at the different causes for each individual. So it's very personalized. and Absolutely, and it's totally all, personalized. And it's, it's often treating it not just one thing, it's treating multiple things in the right sequence to get people better. Exactly. And so he was building on getting rid of the mold and getting out of the environment and ozone and glutathione, which certainly helped. But then he, there were other things, right? He got to get off the acid blocker. He had to get off yep. all these nasal sprays that were suppressing his microbiome in his nose. Get, he had to get sleep. He had to get sleep, right? He had, had, had to, to manage stress. Had to manage stress. He had to irrigate his sinuses and use natural antimicrobials to kill the bad bugs in there. He had to reset his whole gut system and get rid of the pseudomonas and build all this together in a protocol, which it, it sounds complicated. And sometimes it, it is, is, I guess, you know, <laughs> but that's what we do in functional medicine. And it's a very unique approach that is the future of healthcare. It's not something that most physicians are learning in school. It's yeah. uh, something that is actually working far better yeah. than most traditional therapies for these kinds of things. I mean, if you have an acute problem, you go to the hospital, you know, I had atrial fib, you know, you gotta go to the hospital and I get my little electrical system fixed, it's fine. But I think if you, if you have um, these weird symptoms that nobody can fix or that yeah. they're trying to medicate, it, it just doesn't work that well. Yeah, and, and it, you, you really bring a very good point because I mean, ma you know, regular mainstream medicine has its place. You know, you break a bone, you have, you know, a, a heart attack, you have a stroke. There, there's definitely places for acute care medicine, but when it comes to chronic care medicine, I would almost venture to say that the mainstream approach, which is um, either the scalpel or uh, using uh, expensive, potentially uh, toxic medications is actually doing more harm than good in most most yeah. circumstances. It really is. It's, it's unfortunate, but it really is. Nature is medicine because we're so isolated from nature. Both the light experience we have isn't based on natural light cycles. The temperature experiences we have aren't based on being exposed to the environment like we always have been. And it has really detrimental health effects. So you talk about you know, nature and, and how that is really, uh, the disconnection from nature is really a source of problems for us. Major. Um, today, we spend 93% of our time indoors, uh, you know, in big cities. And there's a lot of this research now coming out of Japan on forest bathing. There's actually a, 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 a Japanese word, I believe it's karoshi or karyoshi, or, or I, I could be butchering it, but essentially there's a very significant portion of the population that gets worked to death in Japan. And there, I mean, 90%, 93% of, of Japanese people live in cities. So they're far removed from nature. And so this nature bathing line of research has really become a major focus. Wow. Yeah. And it's now being studied, you know, increasingly around the world, the relationship that we have in the, with nature, especially as our cities become more and more dense and more and more polluted. But in The Genius Life, I talk all about the how air pollution can affect cognitive function and put us at increased risk for Alzheimer's disease. 20% uh, of Alzheimer's cases might be owed actually to heavily polluted air. And today, 52% of Americans live in environments with heavily polluted air. Isn't there like the, there's some like UV app on your phone where you, or you can tell the air quality the air quality the air, index yeah. yeah you can i believe you can actually i think the weather app on on an iphone tells you yeah um the air quality but yeah, yeah. my niece lives in houston she says every day they get warnings not to go outside <laughs> i mean it's scary uh, and, and our indoor home air can be just as polluted if not more polluted it can be than outdoor air but in regard to outdoor air what i think is um really the most pressing of concerns where brain health is concerned is what's called fine particulate matter. So particle, airborne particles that are two and a half micrometers or smaller that are actually able to enter, we breathe it, we breathe these particles in, they enter circulation and they can pierce the blood brain barrier and enter the brains. And they're doing yeah. studies now in very polluted parts of the world, like in Mexico City, 
yeah. where they'll take children and they'll actually see like these fine these particles like magnetite which is made of iron wow. in the brains of children wow and what's very interesting mark you know uh, like Rudy Tanzi up at Harvard doing all this research on, you know, viruses in the brain and how the, it can... The microbiome of the brain. Yeah. yeah, the microbiome of the brain and how amyloid might be a response to an inflammatory insult in the brain. Amyloid is like the gunk that clogs up your brain if you have Alzheimer's and it, it, it's sort of a response to inflammation. It's sort of like a Band-Aid in a way. Yeah. Right. What they're seeing now is amyloid presence in brains that, that you know, of people who have inhabited very uh, highly air polluted you know areas with very high level concentrations wow. of air pollution yeah so whether it's like magnetite you know or other fine particles or the herpes virus amyloid is like this protein which may be actually coming to the rescue but the point is that being in a in a place where there's a high concentration of air pollution might actually be creating this inflammatory insult uh, to the brain which is causing this this a very early presence of the pathologies that we associate with Alzheimer's disease. So so connect that back to nature because you're saying we should move, all move out of cities and become farmers. More that connected be, to nature, yeah. <laughs> that would be good. Yeah, I mean, there are some things that you can do. So spending, spending more time in nature, um, I think is super important, especially if you are at heightened genetic risk for Alzheimer's disease. Mm -hmm. um, so if you're an APOE4 allele carrier, you know, making an effort to spend more time in, in nature. And that's a gene that increases your risk. If you have two of those genes, like of getting About Alzheimer's by 14 75%. Fold, yeah. yeah. Um, so doing that, also getting out in nature is crucially important because of the exposure to the sun. So exposure to the sun, I think is very important. We were talking all about circadian biology. Exposure to bright light, crucially important. Vitamin D, vitamin D uh, deficiency is thought to be a risk factor for developing um, Alzheimer's disease. There's a, a review of environmental risk factors that I talk about in the <clears throat> book, and vitamin D was one of the top. Yeah. Well, I mean, it's a big deal because, you know, depending on the data you look at, up to 80% of us are insufficient or deficient. And the way the reference range works is it's it's based on a population measure. So you take a group of people, you measure you know, a spectrum of the, the levels in a population, and then you look at sort of what's the average, right? And you have like two standard deviations from that, and you can kind of determine what's, what's quote, normal. But normal isn't optimal. If you were right. a Martian and you landed in America today, 75% of Americans are overweight. It would be normal <laughs> to be overweight. It does not mean it's optimal. So the levels we often see in the laboratory ranges are not really where we should be hitting. The levels can be 20 or 30, but you should really probably have 45, 50, 60 at least. And I think, you know, probably 80% of us are deficient or insufficient, and that leads to depression, it leads to increased for Parkinson's, Alzheimer's, cancer, so many different things. And I think, you know, there's been mixed data about we're placing it, fixing it or not. And I think it's complicated because when you're like, you know, people are eating, you know, garbage and they throw vitamin D in there, it's not going to help. Them. Yes, correct. <laughs> you know, if they're not exercising, they're smoking, they're drinking a lot, they're not, ex they're, they're eating crap. You take a vitamin D, it's not going to do anything. But if in, in all things being equal, people who are low in vitamin D have higher risk of this. And if you clean up your lifestyle and you're still low in vitamin D, it'll make a big difference. Yeah, I'm, I'm glad you brought up context because one thing that, that f very few people know, you could be spending as much time in the sun as you want, frolicking all day, you know, in the, in, the, in the beautiful warming rays of the sun or even supplementing with vitamin D. But if you're not getting adequate magnesium in your diet, which 50% of the population does not get no, adequate true. magnesium, the enzymes that convert the vitamin D that your skin creates into its act active hormone form in the body all are magnesium dependent. Yeah. And magnesium, half of us don't consume adequate magnesium. It's found in dark leafy greens, pumpkin seeds, dark chocolate, almonds. Yeah. And, it's and, and a lot of things cause us to lose magnesium. Stress, coffee, alcohol, yeah. sugar, caffeine, you know, all, all those things we love. Exactly. Magnesium is like an anti-aging. You know, it's, yeah. a, it's a macro mineral. We don't consume enough of it. And uh, it's involved in all of the DNA repair enzymes. We were talking a little bit about DNA damage. They all require magnesium as a cofactor. Um, it's involved in ATP synthesis, so energy production. It's so true. I see so much in my practice, and these patients come in with all these magnesium deficient symptoms, and they think I'm a genius when I give them magnesium and they go away. Things like migraines or headaches, constipation, muscle cramps, twitching, palpitations, anxiety, insomnia, anything that's irritable, twitches or spasms in any way or cramps is usually magnesium deficiency. Mm -hmm. And it's so easy when people take it, they go, oh my God, I didn't. No, I was so low. And I think you're right. It's a, 
it's so prevalent. And I think uh, as you age, also your skin doesn't really convert magnesium. I mean, the vitamin D as well either, right? Yeah. If I, I make um, specific recommendations in the book for people, no matter where they are in their life, no matter what age they are, um, it's important. You know, context is 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 everything, really. But you're right. People who are overweight, people who have darker uh, skin complexions, people who are older, they probably are going to need to spend more time in the sun to create the same amount of vitamin D. Um, yeah. So what I once learned from Michael Hollick, who's a vitamin D expert. He said, if you really want to get adequate vitamin D without taking vitamin D, you have to basically be pr practically naked between 10 and 2 in the daytime for 20 minutes uh, south of Atlanta. <laughs> wow. <Yeah. laughs> and, I, you know, that probably isn't happening for 99% of people. Yeah, it's tough. It's tough. Um, I try to get into the sun as much as I can. Because the other thing about the sun... We as humans, you know, we, I think that reductionist approach that we were talking about, it's, I think we're hardwired to try to break everything down. And I believe, I forget who, it, maybe it was Michael Pollan, but in, in nutrition, they call it nutritionism. Yeah. Where they like to break down foods into just the bare essentials to see if we can replicate it in a pill form. And that hasn't, you know, really. Or, or identify, or we even do worse. We, we sort of identify the bad ingredients like saturated fat or sugar or whatever. And so we focus on regulating those in food and then the food companies just kind of dial up or down different ingredients to sort of make it quote healthier but it's not really it's still junk food yeah right exactly and so i think we can apply the same thing to the benefits of of getting sun exposure uh on our skin and in through our eyes so i mean vitamin d is created when the uvb rays from the sun reach our skin but uva rays might actually be useful in terms of creating nitric oxide and actually helping us lower our blood pressure. Yeah, that's pretty cool. Yeah, so blood pressure is another topic that I talk about in the book because it's so related to brain health. If you want your brain to be performing well, if you want it to age well, you really have to make sure that your blood pressure uh, is, is in a healthy range. And getting the right amount of sunlight can help. Can help, Yeah, getting, wow. the, getting the right amount of sun. Now, now, you know, mental health is such a big crisis in this country. Um, you know, one in four people experience major depression in their life uh, it's the biggest cause of the economic burden of chronic disease, not from direct healthcare costs, but things like disability, loss of quality of life, not being able to function very well in your life. And, um, and you know, vitamin D is one of those things that seems to really impact depression. Uh, so you, you talk about a study in the book that has to do with vitamin D and depression. Can you talk more about that? Well, vitamin D is important for the synthesis of serotonin, which is a neurotransmitter involved in mood. Um, a lot it's of the happy chemical. It's a happy chemical. That's what, that's what Prozac does. It increases serotonin, right? Increases serotonin. Um, you know, SSRIs, selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors, uh, can boost serotonin at the synapse, which is. But serotonin is also involved in focus and attention and executive function. Um, but yeah, so vitamin D is important in the in the synthesis of serotonin from its raw material, raw, raw materials, um, one of which is tryptophan, an amino acid. So making sure that your vitamin D levels are in a normal, healthy range, uh, important. And you can easily get your vitamin D levels tested from a doctor. It's a very cheap test. Uh, the recommendations that I make in the book are to make sure that your levels are somewhere between 40 and 60 nanograms per milliliter, yeah. which seems to be a range where we see the lowest risk of all-cause mortality. Mm. Um, yeah, I mean, I remember reading a study, it was incredible, that women who had vitamin D levels less than 45 um, had a 60% higher chance of having preterm labor. Hmm. And when you think of the cost of you know neonatal intensive care and taking care of preterm babies, it's staggering. And you're talking about pennies for a vitamin, it yeah. can liter <laughs> literally prevent preterm labor. So it's really connected to almost everything. And the the differences with vitamin D is that not everybody needs the same amount, right? So what should we be taking? Correct. Uh, not everybody needs the same amount. You really, before you start taking vitamin D as a supplement, uh, you ought to get your levels tested. Um, you know, when we make, when we synthesize it from the sun, our skin basically makes what we need and it breaks down the rest. It's really, it's, it's almost impossible to get too much vitamin D from the sun. Although lifeguards can have levels of 150. That's amazing. Right? Yeah. So, so, and that's not toxic. Right. I mean, it could increase, cal it increases calcium absorption. Um, so you, I always like to recommend vitamin K2 for people yeah. that are in, I mean, especially at those levels. Um, 
But with a vitamin D supplement, I think generally uh, there was a, a, a research calculation that suggested that for the general population, 2,000 international units a day mm-hmm. uh, would be would be ideal to get the average, you know, the average person to an optimal level. Um, but people, again, have different, uh, you know, they're, people who are older might need to supplement more. Yeah. People who are overweight might need mm-hmm. to supplement more to get the same uh, improvement. Mm-hmm. And also, you, you again... Yeah, people who are overweight tend to be low in vitamin D because it's a fat-soluble vitamin, so it all gets right. sucked into the fat. And it doesn't get in their system that we need. Yeah, it gets sequestered by fat tissue. The same also can occur with other fat-soluble vitamins like A, uh, E, K. Yeah. I don't know if you read this morning. This morning, probably not, because you probably don't read the JAMA Pediatrics Journal every day. But <laughs> Not pediatrics, no. <laughs> but I do. And I, I read this paper this morning that showed that if women, when they were pregnant, took 2,800 units of vitamin D compared to 400, which is in the typical prenatal vitamin, that there was a dramatic reduction in um, the effects on uh, bad effects on bone when their kids were born. In other words, their their kids, their babies, had much higher bone density, and then their risk later in life of osteoporosis was dramatically reduced. Hmm. So, and that you know that's almost three thousand units, which most doctors don't even think about recommending, and and some people you know may need up to five or ten thousand if they're not good absorbers, and there's genes that affect that. So people might need only a thousand. But I, I think a thousand is minimum for most people, and it, and it takes about a thousand units to raise your blood level ten nanograms per deciliter. So if you're twenty, you need at least three thousand to get up to fifty, right? And, and and then you can see how you do. But I think people need to measure it. They need to check it, and they need to make sure they're okay. And if not, take the right supplement, and not the the kind that you often get from your doctor. I hate to say, which is vitamin D two which is not an active form of the vitamin, but vitamin D3. And you can get that over the counter now and you can get 1,000 units and others. But you want to make sure you measure it, right? Yeah. I mean, vitamin D2 is the plant-based form of vitamin D. Mm-hmm. And vitamin D3 is the animal-based form. It's mm-hmm. bioidentical to what we create in mm-hmm. our own skin. So you always want to make sure that you're taking vitamin D2. I mean, sorry, D3. Okay, so there, yeah. that brings up a sticky question. So it's, it's usually made from lanolin and other things that you can get it from sheep and stuff and they're fat um so what if you're vegan what do you do <laughs> is it that's a good question uh i've vegan sources of vitamin d3 um it, that's hard to get yeah I, you're right it's yeah it's get. just one more of those nutrients so, that you're just not really optimizing yeah and, then, and often people don't convert vitamin d2 to d3 and if you're a vegan you want to make sure you're you're checking vitamin d3 and you can also check D2. So you can see you might have a really high D2, but a very low D3. So it's important to make sure. Uh, I once uh, took care of this Hasidic rabbi, and um, he had a really bad thyroid problem. And I said, you really need to take this combination thyroid, but um, I don't know if it's okay. He's like, why? He said, well, it comes from you know pig. It's a whole thyroid extract from pig, and it's not kosher. <laughs> he says, it's fine. As long as it's for your health, and as long as you're not eating it and it's a medicine, it's fine. Hmm. So I thought that was very interesting yeah. perspective. A sense from your experience, what are the what are the things that show up, and how do, how did you treat it, and what happened? Well, you know, I, I've had a whole a whole variety of cases. In fact, in a couple of cases that we've had at the clinic, where we had some patients who presented to psychiatric hospitals, and uh, when it came out, you know. You know, when somebody has psychosis or a, a breakdown, if you will, um, they call that, uh, a, you know, a, a psychotic break or a, a manic uh, break or whatever you want to call that. And we've had a couple of recent cases where the patient's underlying trigger was uh, Lyme disease, which mm. uh, is a spiral uh, uh, condition. And always remember, this is a, something that I really like to emphasize to my patients is that way back when doctors used to um, treat syphilis. We don't have a lot of syphilis uh, in a private practice today. It's just, it's, an, it's a condition which was readily treated and it's pretty much gone, although there's, there's still some recurrences of it. But syphilis was caused by a spir- or is caused by a spirochetal bacteria. And that's the same thing as Lyme disease. And Lyme disease is the great mimicker. And um, it also uh, can cause uh, uh, dementia and psychosis. Mm. So yeah. that's one of the conditions that can trigger neuroinflammation. And then also um, there was a recent case um, 
of Bartonella also causing uh, uh, neuropsychiatric conditions and a, uh, a diagnosis of schizophrenia. Um, mm -hmm. So it's, it's really a fascinating, uh, fascinating field. And what the, the problem is, is that psychiatrists are not trained to think this way. And neurologists are not trained to step over into psychiatry. So they're like, they're two different fields, but they're really the same field. So it's neuropsych and neuropsychiatry. Uh, this is an area that is actually really, you know, quite fascinating to me. And I, you know, people always ask me, you know, what kind of doctor are you? And I, 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 I have my own, my own, uh, 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 description. Yeah, I do I, answer that question. <laughs> yeah, I'm a, I'm a psycho neuro immuno endo gutologist, and basically looking at the whole connection between the brain, the gut, the immune system, and all of the the, the body, when it's all sort of interconnected, and it's it's really really uh, fascinating, and you can really help these people uh, who are having uh, significant uh, 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 conditions. So what happened? You saw this patient with schizophrenia, right? And and you you found the tick infections. What what happened then? We're able to we're able to get their symptoms down uh, by treating the underlying cause, which is the underlying uh, 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 spirochetal infection. I also had another patient who had um, a mycoplasma infection, and it's actually known in the uh, literature. Mycoplasma is an atypical bacteria, and um, it's another infection which can cause the brain to be on fire. Um, so it's a, it's a really uh, a fascinating thing. And the, one of the tests that you can do that can uh, check for this, it's a it's not a common test. And I don't know if you've done this, Mark, is the NMDA receptor antibody testing. Um, this is looking at the um, uh, parts of the brain that are stimulatory. And um, this is something that uh, any doctor who has a patient who has gone, quote unquote, crazy or had a psychotic break, they should have an NMDA receptor antibody test, because if you have this, it tells you that there is some type of neuroinflammation that's driving uh, their, their symptoms. Yeah, it's quite incredible. So I've had patients who have schizophrenia before or bipolar disease, and you, know, you think these problems are just so intractable and so difficult to treat, and, yeah. they, and they can be. Um, but, you know, in fact, the, the whole field of functional medicine came out of the field of psychiatry with Abraham Hoffer's discovery that you could treat schizophrenia, yeah. you know, using nutrients and helping to improve the biochemistry of the brain. And then Linus Pauling wrote his seminal paper, Orthomolecular Psychiatry in Science Magazine in 1969, which talked about the perspective of how do you straighten molecules. In other words, how do you correct the imbalances or dysfunctions in your biochemistry? Yeah. Uh, it's called orthomolecular, which means to straighten. And that has really led to the whole field of functional medicine. And we then sort of expand on that with our understanding of the role of inflammation in the brain. And I, and I, you know, many schizophrenic patients have high levels of, for example, gluten antibodies. About 20% of schizophrenics have antiglidin antibodies in their bloodstream. Yep. Uh, when you take the gluten away, they do better. That causes brain inflammation. And when you do autopsy studies on people with Alzheimer's or autism, or schizophrenia or depression, you find that their brains are inflamed. So, yeah. uh, you know, when you start to think about that, it's like, wait a minute, we are treating this completely incorrectly. And this is what was classical of traditional medicine. You treat the symptoms, not the cause. And functional medicine is really about the cause and why, not just what disease you have, but why do you have it? And, and in the case of these brain disorders, it's often not obvious. Uh, and the problem may be far away from the brain. It might be in the gut or it might be in your diet, or it might be a toxin, or it might be an infection, yeah. and, and or it might be mold, and, and it might be all sorts of things that we are kind of missing the boat on. And so we have this potential to sort of rethink our whole approach to brain science. That's what's so exciting when we see you know, the work of guys like Dale Bredesen or others, uh, and nutritional psychiatrists like those at Harvard and metabolic psychiatrists at, at Stanford. They're doing work in this field, understanding the connection between the brain and some of these systemic processes. Yeah, absolutely. And, and when you when you take a schizophrenic um, and you look at them with a PET scan, the positive emission tomography, what you'll see is their brain lights up. And that's because their microglia, which is their immune cells in the brain, are on, literally on fire. And unless you actually treat that, uh, the, a schizophrenic is at high risk for developing dementia down the road because their fire is not being put out. And this mark is, I'm going to mention this because I, when I was, I, I actually do, uh, I've, I've done uh, some lectures uh, for uh, American Academy of Anti-Aging Medicine on neuroinflammation. 
And in the process of preparing for that, I came up against some really fascinating things. One is that when you look at the genetics of schizophrenia, mm. um, there's uh, they, they did this whole genome wide association studies of saying, well, what gene or what genes are associated with schizophrenia? And they did what's called a Manhattan plat, plot. And on chromosome six, um, it, it sort of stood out like a, a, a the, you know, the uh, Empire State Building. And what they found mm -hmm. out is that on chromosome six, chromosome six is highly involved with the immune system. So that tells us that a lot of patients who have schizophrenia have an issue on chromosome six related to the immune system. And what I'm going to tell you next is absolutely positively fascinating. And, and this sort of blew me away. Um, there are two case reports. And remember, case reports are just like a doctor observing, OK, this is interesting. Look what happened. You know, why did this happen? And the two case reports were this, um, and this tells you, you know, how the immune system is intimately involved in schizophrenia. One is a patient had refractory schizophrenia and developed some type of uh, cancer and needed a bone marrow transplant. The refractory patient with schizophrenia got a bone marrow transplant. Well, a bone marrow transplant is basically giving you a new immune system. After he got the bone marrow transplant, guess what happened to his refractory schizophrenia? It was gone. What happened? Gone. Wow. It, it completely cleared up because it changed his immune response to whatever it was responding to. I don't know. But his, his refractory schizophrenia went away. On the flip side, there was another uh, gentleman who also needed a bone marrow transplant. He got his bone marrow from his brother who had schizophrenia. Guess what happened to him? Mm. He caught he, he got schizophrenia? Caught schizophrenia. He got schizophrenia. <laughs> wow. It goes both That's ways. pretty amazing. That's pretty amazing. So, yeah, that's pretty it is amazing. amazing. I, I was I was blown away by that, and I think that you know, in, in you know, people who are doing, I'm you know, I'm a clinician, I'm seeing patients, but the you know, those those case reports are really really seminal to change how we think about how we see these conditions and mm -hmm. the fact that that can happen. And I also found it fascinating that you know uh, we, we talk about the gut microbiome and how that's so important related to the immune system, is that when you do stool transplants, you can literally uh, transplant or infect a person and make them skinny, or you can transplant right. stool and make them fat. You can go well, both doing this ways. With autism, and we don't and Parkinson's, fully... right? They're, they're actually doing fecal transplants yes. with autism and with Parkinson's and seeing real changes in exactly. the brain function. That blows my mind when you think about that. It does. It does blow my mind. And and the thing about this is we are still in the nascent uh, period of really understanding this because it's not like you know you take this one chemical or you take this one probiotic and everything's fixed. It's a very very complex uh, array. And you know we have hundreds of different microbes and bacteria and viruses in the gut. So it's going to take us a while to figure this all out. But you know with, I think we're also in a in a very good uh, stage where you know we have. Um, you know, massive computing power, and we have artificial intelligence. And I think that we're going to probably uh, approach these areas of understanding neuroinflammation and really difficult to treat conditions like ALS, like uh, schizophrenia, like uh, Parkinson's and such. And we're going to be able to uh, biohack them and, 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 and Alzheimer's, right? Alzheimer's. Now, that's yeah. another thing. Now, this is, <laughs> you're bringing up one of my, one of my favorite things. So for years, Mark, what, what did what did neurology focus on with Alzheimer's? It was what? It was amyloid, amyloid plaque, amyloid. right? Yeah. Amyloid plaque. Is, all you got to do is get rid of the amyloid, and you get rid yeah. of part of, of Alzheimer's. That's right. So it didn't so work you out. Get rid so of well. cholesterol <laughs> and you get rid of heart disease, right? Yeah. So guess guess what? Uh, 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 the the plaque, the the beta amyloid plaque that was found in the brain. Guess what that actually is? That's an antimicrobial peptide. The brain is wow. producing beta amyloid in response to some type of organism, be it a virus, a bacteria, or a fungus. So when we see that, those are the footprints of a organism that the body is trying to uh, uh, attack. Yeah, absolutely. And I think, you know, we actually probably should have Rudy Tanzi on the podcast. He's a scientist at Harvard who specializes oh, in Alzheimer's. And he has discovered the microbiome yes. of the brain. So literally, there are yes, viruses, yeah. yeast, bacteria in the brain, which we thought was sterile, that may be triggering this cascade of inflammation. And then the question is, where does this come from? And it seems like a lot of it may come from the gut, which is crazy. How does it get from your gut to your brain? But it does, and it triggers this sort of neuroinflammation that's driving 
things like Alzheimer's. You know, I think I think we often get stuck on one thing, though, right? In in medicine, we stuck, get stuck on it's this or it's that. And, and I think the important thing people remember is whatever your diagnosis is, it doesn't immediately tell you what the cause is. So you could have 10 people with Alzheimer's, they could have 10 different causes. Right. Um, and in one person, you could have yep. three or four or five different causes, right? And I, I just remember one patient I had who was seven years old, really pretty significant, um, you know, Alzheimer's, not not bedridden at this point, but pretty non-functional, also depression, and was struggling really badly. He was former CEO of his company, a family-run business, couldn't function anymore. His behavior was changing. His kids, grandkids, family didn't want to hang out with him anymore because he was acting inappropriate. And it uh, turned out he had so many things going on. I mean, the, the biggest thing he had was high mercury, yeah. which he lived in Pittsburgh and had exposed to the, all the, the steel plants. And they used coal ash for fertilizing land. And they put it on the streets in the winter instead of sort of uh, salt for the icy roads. And he also had a mouthful of fillings. And he also had a terrible history of irritable bowel for 30 years and was on stelazine, which is just like an antipsychotic. So it's like a relaxant for your gut, which is terrible. But he had terrible <laughs> gut issues and bacterial overgrowth and leaky gut and gluten sensitivity. And he also had insulin resistance. He had prediabetes. So essentially, essentially he had all these problems, heavy metals, microbiome issues, and he had insulin resistance or prediabetes, which we know drives inflammation in the brain. They're calling Alzheimer's, you know, often uh, type 3 diabetes. And he had all these other biochemical yep. issues uh, genetically, like methylation problems and and which are the B vitamins that were also driving inflammation in his brain because he wasn't able to produce antioxidants and glutathione. And when we started to address all these things, we got the mercury out, we fixed his gut, we cleaned up his diet, we got rid of the sugar and starch, we optimized his B vitamins. He literally came back from the dead like Rip Van Winkle and was able to function, go back to work, wow. be a functioning member of his family again. And this is someone who would have just been said, okay, you have Alzheimer's and you are going to be in a nursing home and that's the end of that. Uh, and it was pretty miraculous to see that. It sort of right. woke me up to how, by really being diligent with these patients, you can you can really help them either completely recover or dramatically recover. And I've seen, you know, the spectrum from, you know, in the tough cases of autism, Alzheimer's, you know, it depends how much they're, they've got going on, how far down the road they are, but you see amazing stuff. But things like depression, bipolar disease, you know, mood disorders, it's often remarkable how quickly the brain responds, ADD. Uh, and, and, and it's something that we just... Um, you know, unfortunately are not thinking about that well in traditional medicine. And that's really why we do what we do at the Ultra Wellness Center. And we've treated nearly thousands and thousands of patients in this way. Uh, and we now do stuff virtually too, which is kind of fun. So we can see from all over. And we have a great team of physicians and, and nutritionists and practitioners who really help guide people through this, this space. Because, you know, what kills me, Todd, and I'm sure it kills you, is you hear story after story. And I'm sure you get this all the time. Hey, could you help this one? Could you help that one? Or my mom or my dad or my sister or my friend. And, and, and people are just struggling to find answers. And, you know, when you t hear the story, you go, oh, God, I, I know what's wrong with this person. <laughs> but it's because we have a certain set of filters or lenses that we look at. And it's so gratifying. Can you think of any other cases that you want to share that sort of illustrate this? Yeah, I mean, I, I think I'd mentioned this. This is a this is a fascinating case. I, and I, I really can't um, I can't. Uh, 100% prove it, but uh, I talked about it when we talked about the uh, the uh, oral systemic health connection is the connection with the mouth. And there's some really good evidence of uh, the particular bacterium, which is a bad actor, and um, it's called Porphyrmonas gingivalis. And I have seen this in a number of patients who um, have had uh, early Alzheimer type symptoms. You can also see this oral bacteria in patients with rheumatoid arthritis. Um, so looking for this uh, with DNA of the mouth organisms. Um, and again, you know, this is a, this is to me is a really fascinating thing. You know, somebody says, well, Alzheimer's runs in our family. Well, Porphyrmonas gingivalis may run in your family. You may be spreading the bacteria from person to person. And this, this, uh, this bacteria, uh, which uh, is in, found in saliva, it stimulates the immune system and susceptible, genetically susceptible individuals and can really lead to a uh, profound uh, uh, neuroinflammation. And in one patient in particular who I, uh, I saw, he had uh, Lewy body dementia, which is another form of, you know, inflammation. They, Lewy bodies, because they, on, 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 
uh, uh, anatomical examination of the brain, they find these little things and they call them Louis bodies, right? It doesn't mean that they understand it. It's just Louis found it and that's what they named Louis body after Louis. <laughs> and, and when I, when I, when I, and that's actually what, uh, that actually is what, um, uh, Robin Williams had. Ro- Robin Williams had Louis body dementia with yes. Parkinson's. Yeah. You know, so we call it, we call it Parkinson's. We put it in this neat little category and then we call it Alzheimer's or we call it dementia. And we put it in this little category and then we call it Lewy body. And there are all sort of this interacting, overlapping kinds of things. And the, yeah, they can have different clinical presentations, but as you said, there can be many, many factors that go into, uh, into, uh, the, uh, the origin of this neuroinflammatory process. Um, and diet plays a huge role. You know, if you don't have the right nutrients, you don't have the right fatty acids, um, you, you're, you're more going to be more prone to all of your cellular membranes have omega-3 fatty acids. If you're not able to make the, uh, compounds in the body, which are called pro-resolving mediators or SPMs, um, um, mm. and actually have this mm. as a supplement now, um, th- these are actually quite fascinating, uh, uh, compounds. The SPMs are, uh, sl- a selective pro-resolving mediator compounds. They're basically turbocharged fish oil and, uh, certain people, some people can't take the, their omega-3 fatty acids and turn them into these compounds. And uh, I, clinically, I have found them, they either work really well or they don't work. I don't know about you, Mark, but um, these are other uh, things that you can use as a, as a nutraceutical to help turn off inflammation in someone who's got uh, some chronic inflammation. Not to say if you take it, it's going to uh, help with uh, Alzheimer's per se, but it's one of the other tools that we can use to modulate the inflammatory response in the body. Yeah, so true. You know, we, we often in, in traditional medicine don't know how to evaluate the brain properly because we're just looking at the brain, but we have to look systemically. And that's really what we do in functional medicine. And, you know, Dale Bredesen coined the term a cognoscopy, <laughs> like a colonoscopy, but for your brain. And it's looking at all the things we've been talking about, looking at diet, looking at nutrient levels, looking at hormones, looking at toxins, at the microbiome in the gut, looking at infections, looking at mold, um, looking at allergens, looking at the overall health of the person and seeing what of those things are driving adverse consequences for the brain and for brain function. And in any individual, they yeah. may, the same cause might cause different things. So one person might cause schizophrenia, another person might cause Alzheimer's, another person might cause depression. So we, yep. we really have the tools to look at a true cognoscopy. And then, and then the question is, how do we help the brain repair? How do we set up the conditions for the brain repair? So let's talk about how, from a traditional functional medicine point of view, we actually treat these people. Because it's a pretty systematic approach that addresses diet and lifestyle and also some of these underlying causes. Yeah, I mean, so we, we as you mentioned, Mark, we do a lot of the testing. So we'll do organic acid testing, which is checking for uh, the uh, nutrient metabolites that are found in the body. We'll also do gut microbiome testing, looking at all of the different bacteria, viruses, yeast, uh, uh, parasites potentially in the body. Uh, we'll look at markers for leaky gut. Um, the other test that we'll, uh, I do is a leaky brain. You know, just like you can have leaky gut, you can have a leaky brain. There's actually a test for that. Cyrex Laboratories does the mm. blood-brain barrier test. Uh, mm. You can check also for neuro, neuro autoimmune markers uh, with the Cyrex uh, 7X test. Uh, mm. Again, you can do uh, gut microbiome testing. Uh, the one that I like to use is the GI MAP test because I think it's it's quantitative PCR. So I, I find it to be very helpful. Um, the, I think the whole GI uh, realm area is, is an area that we're just learning. And there's going to, I think as time goes on, these tests are going to get better and better. But um, I find that to be uh, very, very helpful to distinguish what's going on uh, inside the, uh, the uh, person that I have. Um, the other thing, which I think is also really, really critical, Mark, uh, is sleep. And this is something that I really emphasize to people is that when our bodies sleep, our brains take out the garbage. OK, and I'll, I'll mm-hmm. guarantee you when you have a patient who's got uh, a neurodegenerative condition, one of the first things that you'll see is disruptions of their sleep. And what happens is uh, during the day, you know, our brain only comprises two percent of our body weight, but it can it, it, um, it uses 20 percent of our body's energy, which means that there's a lot of metabolic activity. And what happens throughout the day is we get metabolic waste products that build up in the brain. And our brain flushes them out during deep delta sleep. If we don't get that deep sleep, we can't flush the brain and take the garbage out. 
uh, in the brain. And those toxins build up those things that metabolic uh, byproducts, uh, fold, misfolded proteins, uh, uh, inflammatory molecules, uh, uh, amyloid, uh, etc., build up in the brain and can uh, affect uh, how the, uh, uh, the person's uh, cognition is, their memory, their mood, etc. It's so, amazing. Yeah, and I think, you know, the, the diet is such a huge role, too, in the brain. I mean, we see that the, the diet we're eating is a highly inflammatory diet in this country of processed foods, inflammation um, that are driven by sugar and starch, uh, excess refined oils, uh, all the lack of things that are anti-inflammatory, the whole foods with all the phytochemicals in them and the nutrient-dense foods. So we're eating a diet that's super inflammatory. So this is the first thing. And often dairy and gluten are among the worst um, and then, and then, and then we focus on how do we get the right nutrients? Because if you're low in certain nutrients, whether it's the antioxidant nutrients or the B vitamins, your body needs these nutrients to regulate your immune system to function, whether it's zinc or vitamin A or selenium or vitamin D, vitamin C, all these are really necessary for proper, uh, regulation of immune function. So getting adequate levels of these is key. Uh, also, we, we really get people on an elimination diet. If they if we suspect, or we test that they have sensitivity to certain foods, we, treat the underlying infections if we find them with, with directly with antibiotics if we need to, or antivirals, or sometimes we'll use herbal therapies or things like ozone and other approaches to deal with infections. We'll fix the gut. Often that's a big issue. So we have a whole functional medicine approach to fixing the gut. We've talked about a lot on this podcast. And, and then we'll address whatever to toxins that are there and help you eliminate the toxins through a really uh, focused detoxification program. And so building on, on the framework of functional medicine, we can identify in each individual which of these things are the problem, and then we can start to map the right treatments for that person. And it's, it's so gratifying when you see this in people's lifelong depression gets better. I mean, <laughs> there was a woman who was um, severely depressed, uh, who was uh, in and out of psychiatric hospitals on lots of medications. Her marriage was falling apart. She wasn't able to really work at, at, at work anymore. She's about to get fired from her job very overweight diet, obviously high in sugar, starch and processed foods. And she did the Daniel plan, which is a you know faith-based wellness program, but it's based on a whole foods, anti-inflammatory, pegan-ish diet essentially. And she said at the six week reunion, she's like, Dr. Hyman, after three days of changing my diet, my depression went away. And I've been on piles of medications in and out of hospitals, admitted for severe depression to hospitals many times in my life. And it's just gone. And I'm like, she goes, is that possible? I'm like, yeah, it's possible. If whatever you're eating was triggering the inflammation in your brain, you stopped it. Yes. So it's really uh, is sort of untapped reservoir of tools and tests and therapies that traditional medicine, psychiatry, neurology are just not using, and is really where the money is. Well, and and you bring up a really good point, Mark, because I, you know, I often uh, ask my patients who are seeing a psychiatrist, and not, I'm not going to bash psychiatrists, but I think the profession of psychiatry is in the dark ages. Um, I can't remember the last time a psychiatrist that I've seen has done a blood test or examined the patient. And, uh, and I think that um, a lot of psychiatrists would actually do a good job if they actually uh, took a, a side course in neurology to really understand how the brain is working. So if you're a psychiatrist and you're seeing a patient and you are not utilizing a good nutritionist, preferably a functional medicine nutritionist, if you're not doing mm. some, uh, some uh, blood testing and you're not actually examining your patient, you may be doing more harm than good. Um, and it's not, and the other, the other, my, my other pet peeve about uh, 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 the psychiatric world is that we are now medicating uh, young children in ways that are unexplored. We're doing polypharmacy uh, in the young polypharmacy in the old with these neuropsych drugs, they're advertised on television. And it is a complete, if you will, show, excuse my French. It is awful. It's a, it's a, ter it's a terrible thing in this country. And I, I'll stand up here and I'll, I'll shout from the, the rooftops because this is a bad thing that we're doing to the brains of our people, the brains of our young kids. This is something that we should not be doing, period. No. I mean, it's true. We, we really are you're relying on, on downstream treatments. So when the neurotransmitters go awry, whether it's depression or autism or Alzheimer's yeah. or ADD, it, you know, we go, well, how do we fix the neurotransmitters? And the question isn't how do we fix the neurotransmitters? The question is, why are the neurotransmitters so screwed up in the first place? <laughs> and it's because of these phenomena. And one, one of the great examples I'll, I'll see is that the basic... Uh, driver of, of inflammation is diet, but there are other factors and anything that causes inflammation can interfere with our 
enzyme function in our in, in throughout our bodies. And there's a key step in converting serotonin, I mean, uh, tryptophan into 5-hydroxytryptophan into serotonin, which is the happy mood chemical. Mm-hmm. And when you get a high level of inflammation in the body, the, the enzyme is sort of blocked and you end up with this byproduct called kinurate, or kin- kinurate, I don't know if I'm pronouncing it right. <laughs> I was read it, I don't remember. Acid. Uh, kinuronic acid, right? Yeah, kinuronic acid, and and that level goes up, and you can actually measure it in these patients, and you see when they have high levels of these quinolinate or kinuronic acid, it indicates inflammation, and you know that the serotonin pathway is being screwed up, and it's bypassing it and producing these toxic molecules that cause inflammation in the brain, and and so one by getting rid of the inflammation, two by giving the helpers for these chemical reactions, you can often really help improve the cognitive function of the brain, but it's really about the inflammation. And that's what's so, so different and striking about it. Now, did you know that most of you are inflamed and living an inflammatory lifestyle? That being inflamed makes you fat and sick? And that being fat and sick makes you inflamed? It's a vicious cycle. So what is inflammation anyway? And why does it make us sick and fat? Well, inflammation can be a good thing, right? It's part of your body's own defense mechanism. If you have a cold or an infection, you bang yourself, inflammation helps your body heal. But it's bad when it goes out of control. Now, what makes us inflamed and what makes the inflammation get out of control? It's mostly our diet. It's bad food, sugar, trans fats, food allergens that are hidden, lack of exercise, stress, even hidden infections. All these things promote inflammation. So how do we deal with it? Well, we detox from inflammatory foods. We just get rid of them for a little while, one week, see what happens. Things like sugar, processed food, junk food, caffeine, alcohol. But what else is important? And I want to spend a little time talking about this other factor that mostly gets ignored. It's called hidden food sensitivities or hidden food allergens. And they're delayed. They're not like, you know, you eat a peanut and your tongue swells up and you have to go to the emergency room. I'm not talking about that. I'm not talking about shellfish allergy where you can nearly die from it. What I'm talking about are delayed, subtle, and often unrecognized symptoms that come from delayed reactions to the things we're eating. And these symptoms can include weight gain, fluid retention, fatigue, brain fog, irritable bowel syndrome, mood disorders, headaches, sinus problems, joint pains, acne, eczema, and much more. Why do we get it? Let me me just say something first. This is an unrecognized epidemic. And most physicians, most practitioners ignore this type of allergy. It just hasn't hit the radar. And yet it's the biggest thing I do in my medical practice to help people feel better quickly and to lose weight quickly. So you have to recognize that it's not the same for everybody. That one man's medicine is another man's poison. And if you're eating something that doesn't agree with you, that you've developed a food food sensitivity to or an allergy, you can develop a whole host of problems. In fact, in this country, we have an epidemic of inflammatory and allergic diseases. We have 24 million people with autoimmune disease. We have 50 million with allergic diseases. We have 30 million with asthma and over 60 million with irritable bowel syndrome. And all of these are connected by inflammation. So so the question is, why have we become so sensitive? Why is our immune system acting this way? Obviously, we weren't designed to have an immune system go awry and create tremendous amounts of inflammation all the time, make us sick and fat. So something's gone wrong. What has gone wrong? Well, it has to do with the idea that food is not just energy. Right? I've talked about this before. Food is information. So it can be good information, right? Good information from phytonutrients, things that are found in plants colorful antioxidants, detoxifying, and anti-inflammatory molecules found in plant foods. So that's good information. But it can also be bad information. And that can include bad information from allergens and from toxins. So when does it become a problem? Well, it becomes a problem when we get something called a leaky gut. The medical term for this is increased intestinal permeability. But it basically means that the stuff on the inside of your gut, which should stay on the outside of your immune system, gets in and leaks into your body and is exposed to your immune system, which then doesn't like it. 
And, and the cause of this leaky gut or damaged in membrane in your intestinal tract is a bad diet, lack of fiber, too much sugar. It's drugs, antibiotics, which kill all the healthy bacteria, hormones, which promote yeast overgrowth, anti-inflammatories, which damage the lining of the gut, acid blockers, which change your whole digestive process, and even stress can cause a leaky gut. So when this all happens, the lining breaks down and all hell breaks loose. What happens is then that on the inside of your intestinal tract, there's basically a sewer, all the stool, food, junk, particles, things that should be protected from your immune system. Starts leaking in across the, this leaky membrane and is exposed to your immune system, 60% of which is right under that lining. When that happens, your immune system goes, ah! and starts attacking these, quote, foreign molecules. But it's really just food that you haven't properly digested or that should have been broken down, but it's suddenly exposed to your immune system. And that's when you start getting sick and fat. So this one-week plan that I've designed is so simple, and it's designed to give your body a vacation from toxins and allergens. And it's what I do for my patients, and I just created it for you in a one-week plan for you to try. All you have to do is this. Get rid of the bad stuff and get the good stuff and the body does the rest. Hey YouTube, if you like this video, you're gonna love the next one. Click on it to check it out today. Getting quality, sufficient sleep on a regular basis is without question the foundation of mental and health and probably physical health as well. So no, right? I, well, you I, already I, knew. Well, I know, but maybe so. listen, this is so huge. This is such a huge idea. So sleep.